Before we start, I would like to thank uh, Dr. John Byrne for being with us today. And uh, Dr. Byrne is going to give us uh, an overview about access management by performing minimally invasive procedure. As you may know, in the US, there is a, now there is, tendon, there is a trend toward, toward per, fig, uh, 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 working on AV fistula, doing min, minimal invasive surgery. And many interventional cardiologists and now uh, interventional nephrologists and interventional radiologists are, are performing this type of procedure. So Dr. Byrne, he's, uh, he's, as I stated earlier, he, he's uh, my colleague and, uh, and my friend, and we, ha we have been working together since 2003 in this area, and he helped me a lot with my complicated kidney patient. Uh, uh, Dr. Byrne graduated from the, from the University of uh, University College of Dublin in Ireland in 1987. He did his surgical training at University College Hospital, Galway, Ireland, and the, uni and the University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff. He did his research fellowship in vascular surgery at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, and he did clinical fellowship at Albany Medical Center, Albany, New York. He received his master's in surgery degree from the National University of Ireland. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeon in Ireland and a fellow of the European Board of Vascular Surgery. He was appointed consultant vascular surgeon at University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff in 1999. In 2003, I met, where I met uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Byrne, uh, he joined Albany Medical Center, he joined Albany Medical Center, vascular, and is currently chief of vascular surgery at Saratoga Hospital and Glens Falls Hospital, New York. And without uh, overdue, I will uh, ask Dr. Byrne to uh, to go ahead and start the presentation. And thank you. Okay. Well, th thanks very much, Rashid. That's, that's a very kind kind introduction. So, uh, when Dr. Dowie asked me to uh, talk today, what he asked me to do is give an overview of AV access surgery as it's currently performed uh, in the United States and to look at it from a minimally invasive point of view. Uh, so what I'm gonna do in this talk is give an overview of, as to the, how we do AV access in this country, what the role is of minimally invasive surgery and the vascular uh, procedures to either salvage these um, fistulas or grafts or in the future maybe even to create uh, AV access. So uh, at the outset, there's uh, one term you may hear during the course of this uh, talk, and that's KDOKI. So um, KDOKI is the National Kidney Foundation's Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative, and it governs a lot of what we do in the management of chronic kidney disease in, in North America, and also to some extent around the world. The National Kidney Foundation is a multidisciplinary group and they issue guidelines on all aspects of kidney disease, be it diagnosis, management of hypercalcemia, hypertension. And they also uh, created guidelines regarding proper and appropriate AV access practice. The most recent iteration were the KDOKI guidelines from 2019, which just like COVID-19 were only really came to prominence in 2020. So these were published in 2020. So throughout this talk, you may hear me reference KDOKI guidelines, and these are regarded as like the gold standard of treatment for chronic kidney disease. So where are we in the United States in um, 2020? At the outset, as you might know from my accent, I'm not American, I'm Irish. So in, in, so in the United States in 2020, um, if we take a snapshot of how patients receive renal replacement therapy, uh, approximately 7% receive peritoneal dialysis. Almost 30% have their renal replacement therapy by means of a kidney transplant. But the vast majority to this day continue to have renal replacement therapy by means of hemodialysis. Uh, this is um, almost 72% of our patients. Uh, they've received hemodialysis either by a tunnel catheter or by a forearm or other kind of uh, um, graft or by means of a native autologist arterial venous fistula. Now, for those of us who work in hemodialysis, uh, even in this country, the, the idea that uh, almost 30% of patients have a functioning kidney transplant seems like a bit of an overestimate. Until we look at what patients actually have functioning transplants, at least in this country, 
And we find the overwhelming majority of young patients under 21 will get their renal replacement therapy by means of a renal transplant. The patients that we typically see, certainly in our clinics here in upstate New York, uh, tend to be the older patients. And these almost all receive their, hemo or their renal replacement therapy by means of hemodialysis or to a lesser degree by peritoneal dialysis. And very few of them are actually referred for a transplant, uh, uh, certainly over 75. Now, it, as I said, most patients receive their renal replacement therapy to this day in this country by um, hemodialysis. It makes up a large proportion of the numbers. This is a graphic illustrated. And a majority of those patients undergoing hemodialysis will have a functioning uh, arterial venous fistula. Some patients will have a graft and some patients, and it's remained stubborn, about 20% will have dialysis by means of a catheter. Um, this has changed a lot. 20 years ago, it was different. It was probably more patients had dialysis by means of a graft and a fistula. But due to the KDOKI guidelines and the efforts of National Kidney Foundation, we've seen a switch, a gradual switch in this country from grafts to fistulas, although still uh, some patients would still have catheters. Now, why is this important? Well, there's a couple of tenets that we have in renal replacement therapy and the management of hemodialysis patients. We believe that catheters are bad. We believe that they're uh, associated with recurrent infections, hospital admissions for sepsis, and they generally have a, a bad outcome. We hold that fistulas are gold standard. They're an all autologous reconstruction. There's no artificial material involved, and they have a very good patency once we're established. We see graphs of somewhere in between fistulas and catheters. Now, do we have any data or any uh, to support our impressions that catheters are a bad thing? Well, we actually do. We, we've lots of data. This is a study from Canada, from the National Nephrology Group in Canada, where they looked at, uh, prospectively looked at a large number of patients uh, starting hemodialysis. And they looked at them over a long period of time, uh, almost uh, six years or almost five years. And what they looked at was they looked at patients who started hemodialysis with a fistula and continued with a fistula alone throughout the course of their um, treatment. And then they looked at patients who started with a catheter and continued with a catheter. And somewhere in between were patients who started with a catheter and then converted to a fistula. And what they found is what we always thought is that patients who have fistula for dialysis and continue to have a functioning fistula have a significant survival advantage over patients who, hemo who receive their hemodialysis by means of the catheter. And this is one of the big uh, prompts or the big impetus, if you like, to re retaining fistulas at all costs. So we want to retain fistula at all costs because it means a lot to these patients in terms of life expectancy and in terms of long-term health. Now, hemodialysis is a, is a 20th century invention. The first hemodialysis machine was uh, invented by this very handsome looking individual on the right of the screen as you look at called William Kolf. He developed this machine in 1943 and famously his first 14 patients all died. Nobody survived. If you try to do that nowadays, you get nowhere. Um, it wasn't until 1945 that he actually successfully dialyzed a patient. Now the problem at the outset in 1943 is that you could only do one treatment at a time. You could have to cannulate a vein or an artery to treat the patient. As you might expect, patients rapidly exhausted their, their arterial or, or venous access and really you could only perform this treatment over several weeks. So it really wasn't a good option for patients with chronic kidney disease who required long-term renal replacement therapy. Um, it wasn't until 1960 that somebody came up with a good plan to um, treat patients with chronic kidney disease. Berlin Scribner is probably the father of uh, hemodialysis uh, in the world and certainly in this country. And in 1960, he was, the, he was a nephrologist, but he had the idea of connecting an artery to a vein by means of a Teflon shunt. Now these Teflon shunts, these are Teflon tubes. Teflon was a 1950s invention. And these tubes measured approximately three to four millimeters in diameter, an eighth of an inch in imperial. And what they did is they made a little incision of the cephalic vein here, and they tunneled a Teflon tube into the cephalic vein and brought it out through the skin here. They made another incision of the radial artery and tunneled a, a Teflon tube into radial artery and it came out through the skin. They then connect this to the arterial limb of the hemodialysis machine, this to the venous limb. In between times, what happened was they had a stainless steel plate, which they secured to the patient's skin. And they had another Teflon tube, which shunted uh, blood from the arterial line to the venous line with the idea 
of keeping these shunts, uh, as we're known, Scribner shunts open. Now, straight away, uh, you can see what the problems were. These were notoriously prone to infection. This segment here frequently became thrombosed. This stainless steel plate uh, on the patient's skin could cause skin necrosis. These tubes could cause ne uh, necrosis as well of the overlying skin. Another issue which is always described is the patients were extremely anxious because they, were, they knew if this was dislodged or inadvertently removed, they lost their AV access. Typically these shunts, even the best hands would stay patent for several months before you then have to find another access. So this was, this was a, a good start, but by no means uh, the, the, the complete answer. The first patient to undergo hemodialysis was a guy called Clyde Shields. Um, Bell and Scribner was located in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Seattle is also the home of Boeing, the air, air, aircraft manufacturer. Clyde Shields worked for Boeing and he underwent Scribner shunt insertion and started hemodialysis in 1960. He lived for 11 years on hemodialysis before he died uh, of an acute myocardial infarction, age 50. But clearly this wasn't the answer. A more complete answer was devised in 1966, where Brescia and Cimino described the Brescia and Cimino fish in 1966. Now, James Cimino was an interferential, was a nephrologist, not an interferential, but he was a nephrologist. And he, before working as a nephrologist, he was a medical student and worked as a phlebotomist in Bellevue Hospital in New York. And when he was in Bellevue Hospital, he had to take blood from a lot of patients who had returned from the Korean War. A lot of these patients had shrapnel injuries. Many of them had shrapnel injuries to their arms and many of them had traumatic AV fistulas. And he quickly cottoned on that if you had a patient with a traumatic AV fistula, these patients were easy to access and you could repeatedly draw blood from these patients. Also, he noted that these patients had very few long-term consequences from having these traumatic fistulas. Now he was a nephrologist, but he persuaded a pediatric cardiologist who was used to dealing with smaller arteries and veins to create an artificial fistula between the cephalic vein and the radial artery. And this is pretty much what we still do to this day. They published their first 14 patients in New England Journal of Medicine, 1966. This was regarded as a seminal paper. This is how we do it nowadays. This is the anatomical snuff box. Uh, we make a small incision, usually smaller than this, we mobilize the cephalic vein and then we swing it down onto the regular artery. This idea of swinging it down becomes important as the talk's gone. So just remember that we're swinging it, we're mobilizing the vein and we're swinging it down because that has implications for long-term patency and also for where the future is going in the management of um, patients with end-stage renal disease. In 1970, the break of cephalic fistula was described. Again, this is unchanged. We still make a transverse incision down to cubital fossa. We mobilize the cephalic vein and we swing it down onto the artery. Again, mobilize the vein and connect it here. Um, a slightly more invasive one is a basilic vein transposition. For those who are not familiar with it. The, the basilic vein is fairly deep in the upper arm. It's surrounded by these branches, the muscutaneous nerve. It's not readily accessible. So if patients who have IVs placed or have blood draws, usually no one accesses this vein because it's usually several centimeters deep. So what we do is make incision along the medial aspect of the forearm. We distend this vein with heparin saline, and then we tunnel it in a subcutaneous plane to superficialize it. We connect it to the artery, to the brachial artery here, and hopefully this is the kind of surgical incision we have at the end with a functioning fistula. Now, um, also in 1976, the first description was uh, made of a forearm Gore-Tex graft, which was used for AV access. We still do this to this day. This is the kind of picture we see. Um, the, diff the graft materials that we use have changed. Back when it, this was first described, you had to take three to four weeks before you could use it. We now have graft materials which are heparin bonded and other materials such as Accuseal, which can actually access the next day. Now, all these, these fissures that I described so far can be performed under local anesthetic with sedation or with an auxiliary blocks. They're all pretty um, well tolerated by most patients, even our sicker renal patients. There are more complex uh, reconstructions that we do. On the left of your screen, you can see an auxiliary artery to auxiliary vein graft. This is uh, known as a necklace graft. We do this in situations where the patient may have, for example, a severely stenotic right auxiliary artery and may have a thrombosed left auxiliary vein so we use the good artery and the good vein 
this is tunneled subcutaneously. We do this under general anesthetic. For those of us who are vascular surgeons who are used to doing, for example, axillary bifemoral bypass grafts, this is a relatively straightforward procedure to do, but it does require general anesthetic. I've not had a need to do this, or the, I've never done this particular uh, reconstruction, but it seems reasonably straightforward. I have done lots of these type of reconstructions. This is uh, uh, an axillary artery to axillary vein loop uh, graft where we make an incision under the clavicle, the same exposure as we use for an axillary bifemoral bypass graft. And we tunnel a subcutaneous graft here. This has the advantage that if it fails on this side of one side eventually, you often have another side to, to deal with. So you've, you've got two bites of the of the cherry, if you like. So these require general anesthetic. There are other um, reconstructions that are reserved for patients who have failed all others, such as a femoral artery, the femoral uh, vein loop graft. We reserve this uh, to last because these are more prone to infection. And a lot of patients really don't like to have uh, um, their grafts in their thigh. They find it somewhat unacceptable to them. There was a vogue a few years ago for these uh, curly Q or loop Gore-Tex grafts are patients who really had exhausted all of their veins, where you basically transect the axillary artery and you do an end-to-end -end anastomosis between a graft here and between the other end of the axillary artery here. And you could also do it in the thigh. Um, one of my colleagues had a, a, did this for a while, but people have pretty much stopped doing this, at least around our part of the world, because the, the concern was that this graft becomes infected or with thrombosis. It then imperils the arm or it certainly will imperil the leg if you do it on the leg. So we kind of, this is the things we did in the past, we don't do so much now. So how do we do it? Well, we start off with, like for all things in medicine, we usually try and start off with the least invasive ones. We always, our first choice is obviously radiocephalic. And our last choice is ephemeral grafts or the more exotic reconstructions, such as tunneling a graft from the subclavian artery to the atrial appendage. But, so we start, we start low tech and we go to the more high tech and more invasive procedures. Um, when we see a patient, uh, I know someone earlier on was talking about ultrasound. When we see uh, a patient's uh, first visit for AV access, this is how we assess them. And this is how we decide what the best option for them is, whether it's up level one, such as radiocephalic or a more complex uh, reconstruction. Ideally, patients are referred from Dr. Dowie and his colleagues when they've got chronic, chronic kidney disease, stage four, and EGF4 of less than 30. Ideally, we see them for six to 12 months before the access is needed, because certainly if we're creating fistulas, not all fistulas work first time, every time, and some need a period of time to mature, especially in the older patients. At that first visit, we do vein mapping. This is the kind of vein mapping picture we get from our text. Uh, this is cephalic vein here. These numbers represent the diameter of the vein in millimeters. Uh, so this is 4.0 millimeters. This is the median antecubital vein, and this is a basilic vein. Uh, mapped out for us. We also do arterial assessment because without good inflow, no fistula reconstruction is going to work. How do we judge success? Well, we use the rule of sixes. Just think of six. So we want the external diameter of our graft or fistula to be six millimeters. We want it to be no deeper than six millimeters from the skin surface so nurses can access it. And we want flow rates of greater than 600 mils per minute. So think of the rule of sixes. I've added another six here. We need at least six centimeters of usable length, which some people talk about. And once you have all these sixes in place, you should have a usable access. Of course, no surgery is without risk. Even the most expert hands, we all have complications. Certainly, I know I do. And the KDOKI, the National Kidney Foundation, recognize eight categories of complications. We're not going to talk about post-operative seromas. I'm not going to talk about neuropathy. We are going to talk about these because very many of these will have an endovascular option uh, for management and for treatment. So what's the, how do our fistulas generally do? Well, not all fistulas are equal. And there's a couple of nuances we, we talk about when we talk about AV accesses. For those of you who are vascular surgeons like myself, for those of you who are interventional cardiologists or cardiac surgeons, we always talk about patency. And we talk about how long a stent or a graft or a bypass remains patent. We also talk about that when it comes to fistulas and graft in end-stage renal disease, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. It's not enough for a fistula to be patent. It must be usable as well. So instead of talking about patency, we talk about functional patency. In other words, how many of them are usable. Um, and this is a study from the Netherlands, quite recent study from the Netherlands, where they looked at over a thousand patients and they compared the functional patency of their different reconstructions. 
and also how many interventions were needed each year to keep those patencies, those, those uh, fistulas or grafts going. For semino fistulas, which we talked about as the first option, the functional patency at year is almost 70%, which is actually quite good because almost 20 to 30% of these will fail to mature or fail to be usable. Uh, they, re they require very few interventions to keep them going. So once you get a good fistula working, it's a good option. Upper arm fistulas, as you might expect, have a greater patency. The reason for that is the artery is bigger, the breaking artery is bigger than the radial artery, and the upper arm veins are bigger than the lower arm veins. So patency, initial patency is greater. They require slightly more interventions, but still an acceptable number of interventions remain patent. Grafts have an almost similar patency to upper arm fistulas, but require a lot more interventions to remain patent, almost three times the number of interventions to remain patent. And some of these interventions may, you know, may be slightly risky and involved, such as pharmacological thrombolysis. So they've got a good patency, but they require a lot more maintenance to stay going. So why do fistulas fail? Uh, well, there's two reasons why fistulas fail. Uh, we talk about early fistula failure, we classify into two areas. We talk about early fistula failure, we talk about later fistula failure. Early fistula failure means Acute occlusion of the fistula postoperatively, which is almost which is almost always a, a technical problem, or within three months of surgery or non-maturation, and the incidence of non-maturation is almost of uh, fistulas is almost thirty percent, and the reasons is this: is this is our typical hemodialysis patient, this is a dialysis patient on one of their visits to the wound care centre. Uh, certainly, the patients we're seeing are not unlike this gentleman. They have multiple medical comorbidities, have morbid obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, peripheral neuropathy, cardiovascular disease. They often have had multiple IV draws or IV infusions to treat their calcaneal osteomyelitis or other medical conditions. And a recent study here in the United States showed that three quarters of our patients coming on hemodialysis have five or more major comorbidities. Um, another re reason why fistulas may not work is the pump speeds are, are now expected to be within the region of 350 to 450 mils per minute. So you need a reasonably good reconstruction to uh, keep those pump speeds going. Um, the re other reasons for uh, non-maturation or early thrombosis may be poor preoperative um, evaluation. And this is where our ultrasound evaluation comes in. Uh, we always eva evaluate uh, arterial inflow. We want an artery to be at least 2.5 millimeters in diameter. We don't want it to be atherosclerotic. Uh, we always assess the veins you saw in one of the previous slides. Other reasons why the, um, but even despite all this preoperative planning, we do on occasion get surprises intraoperatively where the artery, the vein is not quite up to the quality that we expected. Obviously technical error is, can be a reason for failure. If you're not used to doing these, you're not used to manipulating, arteries and veins, you can traumatize these very small arteries and veins. Uh, we, we're pretty used to doing these. We do a lot of distal bypass surgery, so we're used to dealing with small arteries and veins. We try and use very non-traumatic or atraumatic clamps. And when we're doing this procedure, we use Yasuo clips. Uh, we also use uh, 3.5 loop magnification, uh, as well as uh, he good headlight magnification, headlights to uh, help with our, uh, our surgery. If you don't use all of these, you're not used to do it, you can develop anastomotic problems. We use very fine sutures, uh, typically 8-0 for semino fistulas, which is finer than your hair, 6-0, which is about as fine as your hair. So it, there is ample scope there for technical problems. You're not used to doing these procedures. Late failure is a failure that occurs after normal period of usage. Uh, anybody who works in vascular surgery or works in um, cardiology will know about new, new int neo intimal hyperplasia, where you have migration of fibroblasts from the adventitial layer to the uh, intimal layer of the um, artery or the vein. And this is analogous to scar tissue. Um, it manifests itself, um, problems in late failure may manifest itself as low flow rates through the fistula dialysis. The nurses may report high pressures at time of hemodialysis or that the patient metabolically may have persistent hyperkalemia uh, after uh, what appears to be adequate hemodialysis. Um, not, all, not all fistulas or grafts are affected equally. Um, in different reconstructions, the, the areas that are affected are, are different. So if you look at a graft, this is um, a graft, this is a diagrammatic representation of a graft, for example, between a brachial artery and brachial vein. Uh, 
arterial inflow doesn't tend to be where the problem is. The problem tends to be in these reconstructions where the, the vein meets the graft. And this tends to be where 85% of the stenosis are when you have a prosthetic graft. For our semino fistula, the majority of our lesions or the almost half our lesions are at the region of the arterial venous anastomosis where we've mobilized the vein and swung it down to the artery. So we've manipulated, and no matter how gentle we are, this seems to be where most of the lesions occur in the semino fistula. For our upper arm fissures, again, we have a lot of lesions in this area where we've manipulated the vein, but we also have a lot of uh, lesions in the outflow stenosis and cephalic arch or the more central veins. Um, we want to reserve access. These patients only have a limited number of accesses. Uh, very often by the time they reach us, they're not candidates for semino fistulas. They may even not be candidates for upper arm fistulas. They may be on to their fourth or fifth option. So we have to do everything to try and preserve these accesses. Um, we know that if we preserve their access, we're contributing to their long-term survival as well, because we're not condemning them to a life with a graft. So we, we try to be very aggressive in identifying problems and also treating them as quickly as possible. And also for those grafts or, or fissures which have failed, we try actively to declot them. The basic principles of fistulography are uh, quite straightforward. Uh, for those of you who are cardiologists, vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, uh, this technique is going to be very easy. Um, it's the easiest of the procedures, certainly I perform as a vascular surgeon. Uh, there, are, there is potential for disaster, but we try and minimize that. Um, a lot of these studies, are a lot of, the, of our uh, procedures we do under local anesthetic only. Uh, occasionally we'll use midazolam or fentanyl to supplement it. We always use a non-ionic contrast agent, such as the Opti-Ray. 20 or 40 mils is sufficient for most studies and most interventions. For patients who have a fistula which is functioning, but it, it, it's clearly got problems, and you may not want to give them contrast, you can use carbon dioxide, uh, but you have to be careful. Uh, certainly as vascular surgeons, we use carbon dioxide uh, uh, reasonably often, not always, but reasonably often in patients with peripheral arterial disease. I remember doing those studies, we frequently inject 60 or 120 mLs of uh, carbon dioxide into the arteries. You can't really do that with fistulas. You have to be more gentle because if you inject that amount of gas into a fistula, you're going to end up with an airlock in the right ventricle. And I have seen it happen where a patient got an airlock and, and had a, a cardiac arrest on the table, survived, but it's not something you, you want to see twice. So you have to be careful, uh, you, but you can use carbon dioxide. So here's, here's a typical example of a fistula. I don't know why this line is here. Um, this is how we do it. This is just a, a little movie uh, I took last week. We don't know local anesthetic. You just infiltrate the area. Um, you can use ultrasound. Um, certainly ultrasound is, um, I use ultrasound if there is a, a situation where the, there isn't a robust pulse, but very often you can do it without ultrasound. Uh, you've got to remember most patients will have ultra, will have dialysis without ultrasound. So we use a micropuncture needle. We introduce a micropuncture wire. If there's any resistance, as with all interventions, just go to fluoroscopy. And here you can see the um, the wire uh, going centrally to the central vein. So you know you're in a good place. You're not in a good situation. We then use a, a micropuncture sheath, which we thread over the um, glide wire or over the um, micropuncture wire. And then we introduce it very gently into the arm. This is all in local anesthetic. The patient's awake. Sounds like the party. That's the patient talking in the background, just so you know, just uh, stop talking for a second. So you can see it's, it's not, you can do it very easy under local anesthetic. This is a picture we got. He'd had a previous specific vein transposition. Severe stenosis here at the outflow. We then do a reflux shot where you include the fistula and then do retrograde flow. And again, you see this, this gentleman had inflow disease as well as outflow disease. So that's clearly um, that's clearly one that needs, it's not really one for balloon angioplasty. This needs to be surgically revised um, because the problem is if you try and balloon this, it goes across the brachial artery. There is a high probability that you're going to end up rupturing uh, the fistula in the arterial venous anastomosis. Um, okay, let's see if we can get on to the next one. Okay, 
So um, balloon angioplasty, if you identify a problem, uh, you then perform balloon angioplasty. Uh, the principle of balloon angioplasty are the same as those in the periphery. Heparinize a patient, usually about 3,000 units of heparin intravenously. Uh, we gently inflate an appropriate size balloon. Uh, this is usually for peripheral veins. This is usually a six or by 40 or seven by 40 balloon. Uh, we have high pre We usually have to use higher pressure balloons than we would for peripheral lesions. For atherosclerotic lesions in the periphery, you can usually angioplasty a stenosis using um, usually about 10 or 12 atmospheres. For these venous stenoses uh, in AV access, you have to use a lot higher pressures, usually 20 to 30 atmospheres. And often we have concourse balloons that go even higher than that, often up as high as 40, because these are fibrotic lesions, not like the atherosclerotic lesions uh, that we see in the periphery. If there's residuals, residual stenosis, we're usually don't use a stent. We try and avoid a stent. We'd rather do repeated angioplasties and insert a stent. The reason we don't use a stent for the main body of the fistula is because uh, you're, once you place a stent, you're then rendering that portion of the uh, fistula or, or graft uh, unusable. And the nurses may find it hard to cannulate that particular area of the stent or the graft or of the um, fistula or the graft. Um, fistula stenosis. Um, here's a, a patient of mine who has a a semino fish, you can see the arterial venous anastomosis here. Um, we access the, um, the uh, fistula in a, in a, uh, antigrade, in a uh, antigrade fashion. And then this is a falling balloon angioplasty with a seven by 40 millimeter balloon. Uh, if if the, you, you deem the uh, stenosis to be too close to the arterial venous anastomosis, we'll often come from the antecubital fossa down. This is, we use, use ultrasound to access the fistula higher up and then we come down in a retrograde fashion this balloon angioplasty here. Uh, we use a Mustang balloon, a plain old uh, balloon, nothing special about this. Uh, normal inflation pressure is 10 atmospheres, burst pressure is 24. And this hopefully is the, is the, is the appearance we see at the end. The, um, there are a couple of uh, uh, areas that you need to be careful of. Um, in patients who, who have stenosis at cephalic arch, you have to be very careful of this area, very leery of this area. All of us who have done uh, interventions will have at some stage uh, ruptured this area. Um, it's very um, liable to rupture if you, um, it's a very fragile area. The re one of the reasons for this is that cephalic vein, uh, so once, as it goes more proximally, it passes through the delta uh, pectoral fascia here. Um, there's not a lot of room for it to expand. So when it's under uh, arterial pressure, usually this is an area of relative narrowing and uh, the, uh, the vein in this kind of arched area is, is pretty fragile. Um, if you have a cephalic arch stenosis, approximately 30% of brachycephalic fistulas will develop a cephalic arch stenosis. This may manifest itself as what we call a water hammer pulse. So they don't have a thrill anymore. Uh, they have a, a, a pulse. Um, you can do surgical treatment where you can transpose the cephalic uh, vein onto the, um, onto the axillary vein here, but these have a a high incidence of anastomotic stenosis. So this may be an area where you might want to stent it. Um, we will typically use a cover stent in this situation, which is a, a usually a Viabond stent, which is a nitinol stent, which is lined with Gore-Tex fabric. Uh, this is a difficult area to stent because there's a um, it, there's an abnormal, it's a curved segment, first of all. It's not a straightforward uh, area where you can put a stent. And there's often a difficult angle of entry here uh, between the uh, cephalic arch and the axillary vein. And often when you put a wire across, it has the effect of straightening this out. So you're not really too clear where the um, axillary vein uh, begins and ends. Um, we usually use a covered, arch, a covered stent in this situation. The reason we use a covered stent rather than a bare metal stent is that it's been shown that bare metal stents in the cephalic arch do not improve patency, as those cells which cause new intimal hyperplasia grow through the interstices of the stent and cause recurrent stenosis very quickly. So it's not a very good option in this situation. Stent grafts, on the other hand, place a physical barrier uh, between the blood and the vessel wall and theoretically prevent these um, cells migrating through the graft and causing recurrent stenosis. So again, is there any data to support this? Well, actually there is, there's a um, randomized controlled trial, um, quite old at this stage, dates back to 2008, showing that for patients who have cephalic arch stenting using a uh, cover stent versus a, um, a bare metal stent. There's a, there's, there's a big difference in patency rates between the two groups.
So what happens if you do, like I have done on occasion, rupture the cephalic arch? Well, rupture in cephalic arch can occur between, it's reported between 6 and 15% of the time during PTA of this area. Uh, if it happens, remember, you still have wire access. The simplest thing is to inflate a balloon in the cephalic arch to get hemostasis. Um, it is an ideal area for a cover stent if you have access to them. Um, if you don't have access to them, and I've, I've been in situations where I haven't, uh, you may have no option but to just surgically ligate, bring the patient to the operating room and surgically ligate the fish in the antecubital fossa. Once you do this, you've converted what was an arterial bleed into a venous bleed. And very often, there's no need to then attack the hematoma unless it becomes very large. You just hold pressure and the hematoma resolve uh, over time. That's how you deal with a rupture. Uh, the central veins, you will have encounter patients with central vein stenosis. I know uh, some people here do, are, are do this and they're probably very familiar with this. Um, the KDOKI guidelines suggest that angioplasty is preferred treatment for central vein stenosis. Has a very high initial technical success rate in the region of 70 to 90 percent. But you do have to use larger balloons than you will on the periphery, often 10 or 14 millimeter balloons at the very least. There is a role for a stent in recurrent lesions. But there are problems with uh, stents in this area. These are very focal stenosis. They're very rubbery. They're not atherosclerotic. And also, as the veins go centrally, they become, they go from reasonably large to very large. And one of the feared problems with this is that you, um, you may end up getting stent migration or what we call watermelon, watermelon seeding. Um, this is um, a situation where you deploy a stent, and a stent um, is not secured, and then travels into the right atrium or the right ventricle. That's why when you're doing these procedures, you should always make sure that the um, wire goes down the IVC. So at least if the worst happens and the stent migrates, it migrates down the IVC and not uh, into the right ventricle. Uh, I've not um, had this happen, but I, I know of people have had, had this happen, happen in our hospital approximately a year ago, where a stent migrated into the right atrium, right ventricle. It goes through the tricuspid valve. And uh, what happens is this is what you see when the patient um, is brought to the operation room. They usually have to have a, a central sternostomy and they have to have the um, stent removed by open surgery. Um, I don't know if anybody else sees all these red lines. I don't know where they came from, but they seem to appear on the screen. So uh, if you have late maturation, non, uh, late failure, non-maturation, it may be because patients have side branches um, that are still open. I usually just think bring these patients to the operating room, just ligate them under local anesthetic. If you can do coiling, coiling is reasonably safe and effective, but it's certainly more costly. Um, and you have to be careful that these coils don't migrate to the central veins. Again, thrombosis is another uh, issue that we often will encounter. Uh, with these uh, with these fistulas or grafts. You can do surgical thrombectomy. Um, it effectively removes the clot, but you don't identify the underlying venous or arterial lesions very readily. And treatment of these on the fly in the OR can be technically quite difficult. It also won't allow you to treat uh, central stenoses or, or central lesions if they're present. Um, however, it may still have a role in patients who have a large uh, clot burden um, who you don't want to treat with thrombolysis. So if a patient presents with a thrombosed uh, loop graft like they do here, this is a femoral loop graft, which is thrombosed, uh, we usually take them to the interventional suite. This is the preferred way that we use to salvage these uh, grafts or fissures that are failed. Uh, we cannulate the um, graft through the venous limb and then through the ar arterial limb with two uh, uh, size six fr uh, French sheets. One comes through the venous limb going towards the arterial venous anastomosis and one is inserted just beyond the arterial venous anastomosis and goes uh, towards the venous limb of the graft or fistula. Um, once we've done that, there's a certain sequence of steps that we go through. We always use central venogram first to make sure there's flow through the central veins. We then through the thrombolysis of the clot, and we then treat the underlying stenosis, and then we, we pop the arterial plug at, at the very end. So a central venogram is very important. If you have not got any central flow or you can't get a wire into the central veins, uh, basically, it's, it's game over. You, you can't, there's no point in, in proceeding any further. Um, venous outflows are quite common in, in these patients with failed fistulas or grafts, so you have to be aware of their presence and know how you treat them. 
This is a patient we did a couple of weeks ago, 79 year old man with acutely thrombosed left break cephalic fistula. Uh, this is the initial um, fistogram that we did. You can see that the fistula itself is lined with, um, lined with clot. However, he does have a central venogram. He does have flows of central veins. So we could get the wire across this. So we know that we can proceed. So once we did that, we put um, uh, a six French catheter from, sorry, this is a basilic vein transposition, my apologies. Uh, we put a um, catheter through uh, just beyond the arterial venous anastomosis. And then we put another catheter or sheath from the uh, venous limb. Uh, we then infuse, I usually infuse TPA, five milligrams of TPA from the venous end to the arterial end, and then from the arterial end to the venous end. I then allow it to sit for 10 or 15 minutes, and then perform balloon maceration, where we just inflate uh, a balloon sequentially uh, through the clot. Undoubtedly, some of this clot goes centrally. We always systemically heparinize these patients. We give them at least 5,000 units before the procedure, uh, and then we allow this to, allow this to sit. Um, once we've done that, I use a, use a thing called a teratola device, which is this kind of egg whisk or beater here, which effectively whisks the clot. Some of it certainly goes centrally. We go again from the venous end first. You don't want to dislodge a big clot burden here at this end and allow it to tra travel centrally. It, it's perfectly acceptable though that small amounts of clot will, will can be fragmented and sent centrally in this kind of a sequence. At the very end, we use a, a balloon embolectomy catheter we use an over the wire focus balloon embolectomy catheter. With the eye of faith, you can probably see a little balloon here. And we pop the arterial plug to allow inflow. Um, at the end of vasilla residual stenosis, which it was in this patient here, we will either balloon angioplasty or if it's, if it's resistant to balloon angioplasty, we'll put in a Viavon stent to retain patency. Um, bleeding is a complication that we, we encounter when the Kadoki is often due to a repeated puncture of the uh, fistula in the same site. Patients will develop a scab over a, an area of their fistula or graft. Uh, bleeding fish is clearly a case for the operation room. There is, I just mentioned this to say there's no role for endovascular treatment. There's no role for covered stents. In this, area. this patient needs to go straight to the operation room and have this fixed. Um, infection is an issue. Um, the reason, one of the reasons we, we, we try and do fish is at all possible uh, versus grafts is grafts have almost uh, four, four to five times the infection rate that fish do. Fistulas are usually remarkably resistant to um, uh, infection. Reasons for infection would be poor hygiene, increased age, diabetes, and thigh versus arm or chest uh, reconstructions. If you have a complication of infection, we can often, as opposed to peripheral arterial vein grafts, where you, infections where you have to remove the whole graft, sometimes in AV access, you can get away with removing just the infected segment. Um, we will encounter patients who have aneurysms or venous hypertension. This is one of my patients I took a few weeks ago, patient with a mega aneurysm of the uh, is AV fistula. This is a uh, brachycephalic fistula. The reason I mentioned to this is to, if you see a patient with fistulas uh, like this or with aneurysms, uh, it can be due to repeated puncture of the same area, but very often it can be due to high pressure from a central stenosis. So all these patients prior to having any surgical revision of their uh, aneurysm should have a, a venogram and should have any central stenosis addressed because it's, it's more than likely that the reason this has become aneurysmal is because of central stenosis. Um, patients, and this is another patient of mine who developed venous hypertension without an aneurysm. I, uh, patients can develop a, a hugely swollen arm as a result of a central vein uh, stenosis. And again, there are two ways to treat this. One is to simply ligate the fistula, in which case everything goes back to normal, but lose their fistula, or to do what we try and do is do balloon angioplasty of central veins and try and salvage this AV access. Um, I'm gonna just talk briefly about steel. Um, steel syndrome can affect four to 10% of uh, AV access patients. Steel syndrome means basically that the fistula is stealing blood uh, away from the hand. It's, it's, it's more formally known as hemodialysis access induced distal ischemia. Uh, it will affect approximately 1% to 2% of semino fistulas, anywhere up to 10 to 12% of patients with upper arm fistulas. Uh, blood comes through the feeding artery. It will be siphoned off through a fistula. If this fistula is very robust and they don't have good collateral arteries, a good anti-grade flow, or they have underlying atherosclerosis in the forearm, graphs, uh, forearm arteries, they're prone to uh, 
steel, which may manifest itself as being relatively asymptomatic or may uh, manifest itself as digital ulcers like this patient on the right of the screen. Uh, we grade um, hemolysis access steel syndrome from no steel, which is where it's an ultrasound finding, uh, to grade three, where it's severe pain with, with or without tissue loss. Um, if it's a high flow fistula, uh, the Vascular Access Society defines fistulas flow uh, between uh, 1,000 and 1,500 mils per minute, um, or greater than 20% of the cardiac output. If it's a high flow fistula, the common way that we do it nowadays is we try and band or cinch down this fistula. Um, we sometimes do it just by feel, or sometimes we'll put a four millimeter balloon within the actual fistula itself and cinch a suture down around it. It's, it's, it is, it's, uh, can be technically difficult to do this in terms of trying to get into that sweet spot where they continue to have a, a thrill over their fistula, but then uh, regain the pulse at the radial wrist. This can be more of a feel and a, a trial and error type procedure. Uh, rather than any, anything, anything that's hard and fast science to it. Um, the other options that we have, I used to do a lot of these in the past, and it's called a drill procedure. And basically what you're doing is you're splitting the flow. This is for patients who have, for example, steel syndrome due to a brachiocephalic fistula. What you do is you ligate the brachial artery distal uh, to the arterial venous anastomosis. Then you take a piece of brachiocephalic vein from the thigh and you anastomose it at least six centimeters from the artery venous anastomosis. So the blood flow comes down the brachial artery. Half of it theoretically goes up through the fist and the other half goes to the arm. And this can be very effective, but people have gone away from doing it because the idea of ligating a healthy artery um, create, it doesn't sit comfortably with a lot of people. And what they're afraid of is that this reconstruction fails, you could end up with an ischemic arm. Um, what I've gone over to doing and what a lot of my colleagues have gone over to doing is proximization of the um, access. And what, what we do is make an incision just beyond the lateral border of the pectoralis major and usually cut down onto the auxiliary artery at this level. And you anastomose a Gore-Tex graft at this level here. You then tunnel it subcutaneously and do it an end-to-end -end anastomosis between that and the fistula. Uh, because you're, you're, you're taking the intake off a larger artery, the auxiliary artery is bigger than the brachial artery, you're allowing more flow going down the arm, and you're also hopefully at the same time uh, resolving the fish. I've done this twice in the last couple of months, and it usually works very well. It's a fairly straightforward procedure to do as well. So um, I'm going to spend the last five minutes, if you like. I've talked about uh, fistula formation. We've talked about how the endovascular specialist may help to mature these fistulas or may help to salvage these fistulas. Uh, I'm now going to talk about how the interventionists in the future may actually create these fistulas. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, minimum invasive AV fistula formation. Now you may remember during the course of this talk, uh, we emphasized something called swinging the, the, lesion, uh, the um, vein down to meet the artery. Uh, a couple of things we know about AV fistulas, uh, approximately two to three interventions per year are needed to maintain an AV fistula, uh, more if it's a graft. Uh, 20 to 30 percent never mature, they're not usable. Uh, there is a, uh, a pushback, approximately 30 percent of patients may refuse to have a fistula. A lot of patients to this day start uh, dialysis uh, with a catheter. Um, one of the reasons we talked about where, why re, uh, fistulas fail to mature and why they may fail, but one of the reasons is, remember we talked about mobilization of the cephalic vein, either at the wrist or the, in the upper arm, and how we believe the manipulation of this may cause um, uh, an area of stress on the um, fistula and may be an area where the fistulas fail. So we're, we, we look, people have looked at areas, ways to reduce this. And, and the way we're looking at it, and certainly the way we started to use in our group, is the so-called wavelength, wa wavelength uh, endo-AV system. Uh, this is a, um, now, um, a system where you use, uh, where you basically access the brachial artery and the brachial vein um, by means of a six French uh, sheath. And you then introduce uh, two catheters with magnets on the end and you angle them so they um, are located locate in the uh, ulnar artery and ulnar vein, the forearm. And then once they're located side by side, these magnets cause these um, probes to align quite accurately. You then use this little radio frequency electrode uh, 
uh, to very precisely uh, burn a hole, if you like, create a, a four millimeter connection between the artery and the vein. And this is minimally invasive uh, system. There are um, newer systems which allow you to do it with four French system, which for those of you familiar with this, this is a very small system. And what you can do is access the, the artery and the vein, the upper arm. But it's best if I probably show you um, a video of how this happens. Just to familiar yourself with the anatomy, this is the brachial artery. Um, the brachial artery splits into the ulnar artery here and the radial artery. The ulnar artery tends to be slightly bigger than the radial artery, so that's why we select out the ulnar artery rather than the radial artery. And the uh, ulnar vein runs alongside uh, the um, uh, ulnar artery, often in pairs. This is the reconstruct, this is the anatomy in the upper arm. So a uh, part of our screening, we always want the brachial artery to be at least two millimeters or probably bigger. It usually is bigger than this. And we also want the veins to be of a reasonable size. And we want the target artery and vein to be at least two millimeters in diameter. Um, as I said, the steps are as follows. We gain access to the brachial artery and vein. We navigate the devices to create, um, to into the ulnar artery and vein. And then we align the devices to create an endo arterial venous fistula. And once we've done that, we've got a communication between the uh, ulnar artery and the ulnar vein. Um, sometimes you will and sometimes you won't embolize the brachial vein. The reason we do that is to deliberately occlude the brachial vein so all the arterial flow is diverted in superficial veins. So let's see if we can show you a video. Here's a video. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a video produced by the company itself. You access the brachial artery uh, and the brachial vein. Uh, you place guide wires into the uh, ulnar artery and the ulnar, ulnar vein. You introduce the, um, the um, wavelength device uh, into the ulnar artery and vein, the upper part of the arteries. These magnets then allow to lock uh, um, precisely together. There's a magnet here, a magnet here. And then the little uh, radio frequency probe allows you to create a channel, a four millimeter channel between the artery and the vein. It's a very precise uh, channel. Uh, these catheters are then removed, and hopefully once they're removed, you have a flow between the artery and the vein. Uh, you can then place an embolic coil. You're already in the brachial vein, so you can place an embolic coil. And then you've got access through, you've got basically arterialization of all the superficial veins. Um, typically, you will put the arterial um, cannula when doing dialysis in the mean antecubital vein. And for example, we'll put the venous one in the subalic vein in the upper arm. Uh, the problem, the only problem we found with this is nurses, when they're doing this, don't have a surgical scar to guide them. So, whereas they may know from a semina fistula or brachycephalic fistula where exactly arterial venous anastomosis is, they don't have the guidance here. But they usually figure it out very quick, and that's a minor point. Um, this is a live action picture, if you like, of how it's performed. This is what it looks like angiographically. Uh, you have the um, arterial and venous. Um, catheters inserted, they're rotated, they're markers so you can see where the, the magnets are, you align the magnets. This is what the probe looks like in real life in the cath lab and this hopefully is what it looks like uh, at the very end with a patent AV fistula. And then you at the very end, like I said, you can form uh, brachial vein embolization. So um, this is, um, like I say, what, what, how does it work in real life? What's it like to cannulate? Well, this is what it's like to cannulate. Um, as you can see, the, there are no artery, there's no scar to guide you. Uh, so you have to uh, decide which you're going to use the arterial and which you're going to use the venous. This is the patient being cannulated. Uh, this is the patient who's had a wavelength procedure performed. And this is them undergoing dialysis. So it's cosmetically very appealing. Uh, you theoretically uh, avoid mobilizing the artery and the vein and uh, creating new intimal hyperplasia. You also theoretically allow um, more veins and arteries to be used. Uh, the algorithm where this lies, uh, obviously the first choice would still be uh, a radiocephalic fistula if it's possible. This would lay somewhere between a radiocephalic fistula and a brachycephalic fistula. The instance of steel associated with this is very low. So how does it work in real life? Well, these are the initial results. The patency is very high, almost 80% patency. Um, in the first 300 and 400, 390 or 400 days. Very few interventions are required to maintain patency. So this, I think, may be the future of um, AV access. So interventions in the future may not alone be involved with maintaining and salvaging fissures and graft, 
they may even actually be involved in creating them as well. So conclusions, um, management of, uh, of fishes can be complicated in some situations, but for the most part it's clearly within the remit of an interventional cardiologist or an interventional radiologist or even vascular surgeons and nephrologists. Um, but the management of most fistula complications then the vascular and like I said, a skill set is within the remit of, us, of all of us who do interventions. And you know, in the future, I think there definitely is going to be a role, uh, however big, for um, endovascular uh, technologies in the creation of fistulas. Um, at the outset, I said I'm Irish. Uh, we play soccer like you do in Algeria. Uh, the only thing is, I wish we were as successful as Algeria. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your excellent presentation, uh, dear colleague. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. So, uh, before uh, before uh, letting uh, Dr. Samir and Fogadi moderate the discussion, uh, I, I'd like to welcome uh, my friends, Dr. Benziada, our uh, uh, vascular surgeon, who had performed a lot of uh, AV fistula, and he had a great experience. He he, he has joined us now. And uh, Dr. Saeed Anim Saud, chef of uh, nephrology division of Nimsus. And I, uh, I wish uh, they would intervene in uh, the discussion. And uh, you, you can see everyone on the right screen uh, the, the chat, so you can raise uh, your hand if you want to to uh, to ask a question and leave your microphone off during the discussion and i uh, so i uh, i give the floor to mr samir Nia, and uh, uh, dr mohan Fouali to uh, moderate the discussion and thank you Uh, uh, do you hear me, Professor Ben Ghadda? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Okay. You, uh, you and Samir, you and Samir. Uh, first of all, uh, Salim, salam alaikum. Are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. I, ah, okay. I, I uh, turn off my uh, my uh, my mic. Uh, okay. Just I have a question uh, for the stenosis of cephalic vein yeah. arch. Uh, in my own experience, uh, small experience, I have, I thought in my question that the stenosis may be due to the higher output. Yeah. My own experience. Yes. And sometimes when we, I have, we make a diagnosis of uh, our uh, cephalic vein arc stenosis, a uh, lot of time the the outflow is higher. Yes. In Algeria, for our patient, for example, the, the flow is very higher, more than two liters, 2,000 milliliters. And uh, I thought that this stenosis, it is due to compensate the outflow. Because when, we, when uh, the stenosis is created, the mm -hmm. outflow will be low. And the, yeah. and the, uh, the follow up, I see the patient then develop a neurism. And the neurism in the neurism, and sometimes there will be clot, and the fistula can be blocked and thrombosis. In Algeria, for example, we have this technique, and sometimes we create another fistula. And sometimes with Dr. Hania, when he was in Algiers, we do uh, angioplasty without stenting. But for the stenting, for example, do you consider that the stenting when we make mobilization of the arm. Can we not broke the stent or make some complication, dynamic complication? Yeah, I mean, the, st the stents we use are Viobond stents when we do this. We don't use bare metal stents. You're right, bare metal stents, such as uh, uh, the, the stainless steels, balloon expandable stents, you're quite right. They would be quite rigid in that situation. Um, the stents we use are Viobond stents, which are very flexible they're very flexible stents so they um so there's no real worry about that um you can basically turn them around and make a you know make a chime and a knot and they still remain patent they're they're actually very flexible um 
but you're absolutely right for the more rigid stainless steel stents you, you really don't want to put those in that situation because first of all they're not going to work and secondly you're worried about just what you said it's a very mobile area you're putting you know rigid straight stent into it um you can put um you know a self-expanding stent in a nice and all stent in that area but again it doesn't provide any long-term patency advantage um so if you're going to put a stent you really need to put the via bond stent um Viabon really is the only one that's flexible enough that I would trust to to put in that area. There are other stents um, made by Bard, for example, the name escapes me at the moment, but they're they're more rigid and you know really there's only one stent I would put in that area that's flexible enough to make me feel comfortable doing that. Uh, Thank you very much. I agree I agree with the, with this uh, this comment. In the past, to use the only balloons and. Uh, because of a rupture or difficulty to uh, or dissection in the in the, in the site, we uh, used a lot of uh, material, uh, balloon dependent stand, uh, uh, stand dependent balloon and uh, self expandable balloon. Also, there is a lot of problem in in this area, rupture and uh, yes. But now, uh, really, with the, the new device, because Verban for us is a new device. And uh, is is good device and adequate device for uh, for for this uh, area. Uh, uh, now uh, our approach is primary uh, via band stent. After good preparation with scoring or or, or uh, some other other devices for preparation of the, the lesion, we uh, we go on to to the via band directly and to uh, inflate. We try to give the maximum. Of, uh, we oversize uh, sometimes the the, the stents, the stents, and we, we try to give the, the, the maximal oversizing for the for the, for the region. And the, the result is great, yeah. really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah, we usually uh, we usually try and use about a six millimeter via bond stent if we can. Yeah, yeah. I agree totally. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, John, thank you for this uh, picture for all you. Uh, for diff you, you discuss the different aspects of the edifice, like uh, as you can, as you, you say, the, 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 the fistula in our country is, um, is only the, the tool, the, the way of the, uh, to represent the life of the patient because we, uh, uh, the, the renal transplant clearly insufficient in our country, so we have a lot of patients uh, treated only by uh, 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 fistula, hemogenesis, and uh, you for the material, you, you know, is not very uh, comparing to cardiology uh, material. I'm car an intervention cardiologist. I know that we mm. use a lot of material in cardiology, and for fistula, we need sometimes we uh, n not a lot of material. You know, you need some wires. Uh, as you mentioned, the conquest balloon is completely enough for uh, all 90% uh, of procedure, and uh, uh, for stent may be so, not lot stent, but it's not uh, mm. not very expensive. And uh, this, but the, uh, the service we offer for the patient is very very important. It is life. Yeah. Le yeah. And now when you treat uh, uh, coronary stenosis, maybe for comfort, maybe for n anything. But when we treat uh, the fistula, we we save the, the, the patient. Uh, just I am just uh, some questions, technical questions. What uh, what do you think about as a cardiologist? You know, we, we perform only uh, 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 every day uh, a radial approach for uh, coronary angio, and for proximal proximal as you mentioned it for proximal yeah. uh, anastomosis or, or uh, close to anastomosis. Uh, lesion. Personally, I use from long time uh, the approach from radial, from 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 below. Uh, mm -hmm. so we yeah. Use and it's uh, easy. Uh, we use uh, uh, thin material uh, from uh, wires uh, from cardiology and uh, uh, and I think is uh, uh, even for uh, complications. Is sometimes I have some colleagues who say uh, surgeon or radiology says ah it's not, it's it's not good. You can have a dramatical complication. You can have still syndrome. You can favor, favor compare still syndrome and something like that. I'm not. Uh, I, I, I'm not. What do you think? Uh, 
about this? Well, I, I think I think I think it's it's very good. It's an intriguing idea. I mean, I think it's it's great if you can do. It. I'm I'm doing it retrograde. Our, our patient population tend to be older. They tend to be diabetic. Um, their regular arteries aren't always the best in the world. Um, so I think that's what we probably run into. Um, I know in other colleagues working in other parts of the United States, they have a younger patient African-American population, for example, whose arteries and veins certainly would be suit more suitable for that approach. Um, in upstate New York, our patients are Caucasian, they're older, they're diabetic. So it, it's probably, a li it's, it's a great, it's an intriguing thought. And it's a great, I, I think it's great. But um, for our particular patient population in this part of the world, um, uh, I still showed a slide of one of our typical patients and he is very typical of one of our patients. So, you know, it can be, but I think it's a great idea. I think it's really good, um, especially with, with all the kit that's available nowadays. I've got one question. Have you ever used the brachial artery to do an anti-grade approach or it's just always been radial? Mm. Have you ever used the brachial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Archery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a great idea. I think I do think it's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will we will on occasion balloon the anastomosis, but you do it. You do it care. You, do, you have to be very very careful. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And the second the second problem in our country where you know uh, we uh, we we keep for a long time. Unfortunately, the jugular uh, catheter. Mm. So we mm. have a lot mm. of proximal problem. Yeah. Uh, in uh, yeah. central central vein. Now we have lo we uh, we should perform uh, sometimes a lot of procedure of uh, uh, central vein, which mm. is completely very difficult and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, most likely uh, complex. And uh, uh, we use uh, I uh, for this I use systematically stent because uh, why. Uh, you, uh, because uh, it's it's easy, easier to come back if there is stenosis or if yeah. you have if, if you did the first procedure uh, for occlusion, you put a stent and uh, when you come back it's, it will be easy because you have the stent you have to cross the stent again. Yeah. Uh, that, that's why and the, for to, to avoid the immigration we use the oversize and mm -hmm. the long stent also long yeah. stent yeah. to, to yeah. keep it. Uh, uh, the, okay, the, uh, uh, Mohammed, you have something to add, or in? Uh, no, no, I agree totally. I, I th and I think there's a lot more technology coming down the pipe as well. People are talking about dedicated venous stents. Certainly, we're using dedicated venous stents in the periphery, such as the Nova stents and some of those for iliac veins. Yeah. I think yeah. it's the same way with the central vein. I mean, you know, the the, the picture. I, I, mean, I think you're right. Using longer stents is, is key, and uh, I think with more dedicated venous stents, I think that's going to be the key as well. We usually over, yeah, we just like you, we oversize it. We're using big palmar stents in this this situation, as well. Um, but you know, we have seen patients where the, the stent maybe has been undersized. Uh, I think that was the issue in the patient I showed you, where it had been embolized to the right ventricle. The stent was clearly undersized for the size of vein involved. You know, yes. Mohammed, any question or in uh, Wali? There is a question from Saidani. You can read it on the chat. Please read the question. On the chat, on the on your on, on, on the, the chat, on the chat. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. Screen, right screen. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Um, uh, let's have a look. Saidani, thank you for the presentation. What you prepare, what period it will between the uh, chocolate catheter and the prosthesis? If we take into account the many complications of the prosthesis, and uh, in your experience, how long duration of graft access? Well, we always, we always, I guess the question is tunnel catheter or um, prosthetic graft. I'll, I'll always do prosthetic graft over a catheter. Um, the, um, it can be used pretty quickly. It's got fewer long term complications. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll always use a, a pro if we have the option between a prosthesis, uh, for example, a forearm Gore-Tex graft and a cath, we always put in a, in a forearm Gore-Tex graft for sure. Uh, the answer is access longevity of these. I mean, uh, I have had one patient who's had one of these forearm grafts last for 14 years. That's the exception. Uh, I don't know how much graft material they actually had left but after those 14 years of, of repeated cannulation, but you can get long, good duration in certain circumstances of these graphs, but nothing's 100 percent but definitely always graft over over a catheter john if i can if i can add one thing uh, samir so yes. there, 
the, this new data that were published in the US. So when you start a patient with, with a, a new patient and you dialyze him and you start him with uh, 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 hemodialysis catheter as, as the initial access, so they found that the mortality rate is very high during the first year. Some of data they, the, some of data they say between 50 to 70 percent. These are patients who are starting on acute, acute dialysis with the tunnel catheter. So between tunnel and, and graft, the graft will make more sense. But just to add to what uh, John Byrne said. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me ask another question about acute thrombosis. Oh, yeah. I, 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 uh, I want to, see, to, to know how we, the, uh, the, the management, the organization of, uh, is there any network between radiologists, uh, center of dialysis to, to, take, uh, to take a patient uh, immediately from uh, if acute thrombosis uh, cure uh, to uh, your, uh, your center, for example, how you manage this kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, how do you manage it? Yeah, it, it's, not, uh, it's not the emergency that acute thrombosis would be, for example, of uh, causing ischemic limb. It's not in that, that degree. Uh, if we... No, not the uh, acute, acute thrombosis of, of, of the access. How to yeah. manage it? Yeah, we usually will manage that. We, we'll do it kind of semi-electively. We'll do it then the next day. For example, if someone comes in at night, uh, we'll, we'll do it the next day. Uh, we do it. In the, we usually do it in, between nine and five, Monday through Friday. So it's not it's not the threat to life or limb that an acute arterial embolus is or the periphery or acute myocardial infarction. So we do it semi-electively. So if somebody came in this afternoon to our office here, we'd set them up for tomorrow morning. We come in, we do it with all our techs on board and whatever. So you've got a little bit of you've got a wiggle room of two, you know, a couple of days, maybe uh, forty eight hours or so to to get to get things up and running. So we, we, we do it promptly, but we don't do it in the middle of the night. Uh, and do you think that the new, the new device for thrombectomy changed something in... Uh, in, in, in I, I, to be honest with you, I've, I've colleagues who, who, who use all the newer devices, and I have colleagues who just still use uh, balloon and TPA, and they all seem to have the same outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me have another question, if I can intervene. So, John, one uh, like uh, like Dr. Samir was saying, in Algeria, having having a patent AV fistula is like life saving. It's not for mm -hmm. comfort, like you do sometimes cardiacatization and then some, or and uh, so even one of the goal of uh, maybe this talk too is to one of the question, and I think we spoke about this last year, and I, I asked you a question. I told you. How do, how do you see, for example, if you, we want people in Algeria, like nephrologists and cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, to, to get some training and to, between them, they train each other and, and ultimately they will help the Algerian, you know, the renal patient mm. in Algeria. Mm. They're, yeah. not, they're, they're not getting enough access and uh, they're just not doing well in general. So what, uh, what the advice and how, what's the training? Is it possible that that someone like your friend, you told me one time that they may go to Algeria for one week, do like do intervention and train people, or what do you see? Is you just uh, um, I think it's always easier to um, people are always often more com more comfortable in their own environment, so it's often easier to come to see somebody doing something rather than somebody going abroad to do it. Um, there was um, we did have a an exchange program uh, called the Albany Vascular Inter. International Fellowship, which ran until a couple of years ago, where we could bring people from abroad. We brought people from South America and you know Asia to Albany, where they could they get a little bit of hands-on experience. We got a um, we got um, uh, an exemption from the uh, New York Department of Education to allow them to do that. So there is there is a mechanism by which it, could, it can happen. Um, Obviously, everything, <laughs> everything in this country is about money. So it's, it's the uh, get, but so what we did is we worked out with companies, some of the companies who um, manufacture graphs or stents to to sponsor these programs. So that's how we worked it. Um, so that that's how we got around. We we managed the financial side of it. So the companies would sponsor the individual to come. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. 
And you think uh, for for training, I think I think the I believe of of uh, of skill skill of cardiologist. I think it's very it's easier to to yeah. to train a cardiologist and yeah. cardiologist to do this kind. Yeah. And uh, uh, since we have uh, the 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 environment, we have the cat lab. You know, the, the cat the cat lab and the materials. I think we can organize. Uh, uh, more training or easier for, for intervention cardiologists. I think yeah. we have to interest the intervention cardiologists to do this kind of procedure. Yeah, yeah I think you're absolutely right. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, for interventional cardiologists, this stuff is easy. This is easy, easy, easy compared to what you guys usually do. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff you, you can uh, game remotely as well with these kind of Zoom meetings. For example, if there's a situation where you can have case conferences, like what are you going to And a lot of these cases are not some of them are emergent, but a lot of them are kind of, you have got some time to play with. So I know within our group, we're a big group of uh, vascular surgeons, about 12 in our group. And we will often, you know, have conferences either by phone or text or on phone where we say, what will you do with this stenosis? What will you do with this in, in real time? So, you know, you can gain a lot just from these kind of conference, Zoom conferences, what will you do? Well, I put a balloon or a stent in this area and you don't necessarily need to be there physically to do that, especially if you have already have the skill sets like an interventional cardiologist to do these procedures anyway. You might just be asking questions of judgment, which is a more appropriate way to go. So, yeah. Benziada, where is Benziada, our vascular surgeon? Where are you? Benziada. Hey, la pas de micro, madame. Salim. Aya, Mr. Masoud, Saidani, our uh, our nephrologist. Another, another, another question. The last uh, one. For, last one, yes. Uh, why is so long a time for maturation? Yeah. Not yeah. Yeah, usually our maturation time for fistulas is usually eight, eight to 12 weeks. Uh, that's what usually what our maturation is. Uh, we try and get them in well ahead of time, usually six months uh, or so more ahead of time because not everybody's going to mature first time every time, uh, especially with these older patients. So we, we try, that's why we try and get, it's not six months for maturation, it's six to 12 months to absolutely ensure that we have a functioning fistula because even we see somebody today about we get them mapped, we get them scheduled, it's going to be a few weeks time, then you're into eight to 12 weeks before it's usable. And then that's assuming it, it works first time every time, which we know it doesn't, you know, 20 or 30% will not, will fail to mature. So then if it fails to mature, we've got another, another bite of the cherries uh, before, you know, so that's why we're talking about six, 12 months isn't necessarily to, it's not the maturation rate, it's to get, we usually try and do it well ahead of time to allow us for the fact that some of them will fail to mature and we don't know ahead of time obviously you know which ones are going to fail to mature so it's to make sure that as many patients as possible arrive at hemodialysis with a functioning fish and the same thing happens we do pay we do a lot of patients who never get to use the fistula because they either die before they go on dialysis or they stabilize and their renal function never necessitates dialysis so it's it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of an inexact science, but usually you would expect a, a good fist to mature in eight to 12 weeks, sometimes sometimes even sooner in younger patients. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's what the six to 12 months is. Oh, thank you, everybody. See, uh, Samir. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Rashid. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, You're welcome. For, uh, for last instance, I, uh, uh, very very glad to uh, to attend this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this meeting, uh, and uh, thank you thank you. Uh, we uh, we hope to uh, to see you uh, <laughs> <to> somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Thank you, Rashid. Thank you.